Um, We're in Acts chapter 9. Uh, Acts chapter 8 gave us two conversion stories. The conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch and the conversion of Simon the magician, as well as, uh, if you're optimistic, the kind of reconversion of him as he repents, or if you're op uh, not optimistic and cynical, then he falls away. Um, I'm going to choose optimistic. You choose whatever helps you sleep at night. Um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 now, and we're going to see another conversion story. And that is the conversion of Saul, who we more commonly know as Paul, which makes it a pretty pivotal chapter. Because really, when you get to chapter 13 on, all of the rest of this book is going to follow this guy. And, and we're going to be looking at his life, his apostleship, and things like that when we get to the second half of the year and we cover uh, the second half of the book of Acts. So in uh, chapter 9, we're introduced to him as Saul. Uh, Saul is a Hebrew name. Um, Paul is a Greek name. It is unclear as to whether or not uh, he used both names all along, which was not an uncommon thing. You can think of multiple people in the Bible who had multiple names, and depending on the context, would be called that, and you have Peter and Cephas and things like that. Um, uh, so it may be that he was always Paul and he was always Saul, uh, and it just is the context of him leaving the Jewish community and heading out to a Greek Gentile world that causes the predominance and the switch in the text to talking about Paul instead of Saul. It might be that. It may also be the case of him having a new name given to him somewhere along the line. Of course, we have evidence of things like that in the Bible as well. And, and again, you can look at someone like Peter. And so uh, it, it's just simply unclear as to which one it is. But what we need to keep in mind is that sometimes I'll call him Saul and sometimes I'll call him Paul. Mostly I'm going to call him Paul, even though the text calls him Saul. And if I keep saying Saul and Paul back and forth, I'm going to sound like a Dr. Seuss. So <clears throat> just be aware, same guy. Don't, uh, don't confuse it as talking about two different people. So in Acts chapter 9, we're introduced to him uh, in terms of we're now going to follow him. In Acts 8, we saw him for the first time, uh, where they are, uh, excuse me, I guess you'd have to back up to Acts 7. Acts 7 is where we saw him the first time, and he was holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. So we are introduced to him as the young man named Saul. At that point, chapter 9, we're reintroduced to him as he becomes a more major player. And so it begins by saying he's breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, and he went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Uh, so as we look at him, uh, we, we need to understand a couple of different things. We're going we're gonna, to, in the end, look at some of his journeys and tie some of those details together, but we need to know him as a person as we're introduced to him. And he's headed over to Damascus, which if you look at that map, is the one circled right at the, at the top. Uh, and Damascus is in Syria. If you remember what we've read in the previous chapters, Acts 7, Stephen is stoned. What happens to the church? Scattered, yeah. So they're scattered from Jerusalem. Up until the stoning of Stephen, there really is only one congregation. And it's in Jerusalem, and they're all meeting there. But then after the martyrdom of Stephen, everybody kind of shoots out, and they head back to their homes. And if you want to know where their homes are, you go back to Acts chapter 2, because in Acts 2, we are introduced to uh, the apostles speaking in tongues, and we get this huge list of different languages. And it says that all of the different people from all of those different areas where all the different languages and dialects are spoken were hearing them in their own native tongue because they were there for Pentecost, but they were from different areas spread as far as the capital of Rome itself. So when the brethren scatter, they scatter far and wide. Acts 8 introduces us to the apostles now expanding beyond Jerusalem because Acts 7, everybody scatters except for the apostles. Acts 8, then you have 
Philip in Samaria, which is, you look at that map, is right in the middle of it, right? And that, that territory of Samaria with the Samaritans, kind of the, that group of Gentiles who are half Jew, half Gentile in their practices and behavior. And eventually, uh, the apostles go up to join Philip there and his work in Samaria. So we're seeing an expanding of the apostleship uh, in terms of their travel. Uh, we're seeing a huge expansion of the brotherhood in terms of their travel because they're all going home. They're all traveling back to the countries from which they had been. Um, it seems as if when the church is scattered from Jerusalem because of this great persecution, in general, things settle down. Uh, uh, Stephen's killed, the church scatters, and the leadership, the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem is at, at peace with that outcome, I guess would be way, one way to put it. We've, we've driven the problem out. Uh, it's, it's somewhere else now, but it's not here in Jerusalem. But Acts 9 introduces us to Saul as the guy who, that's not good enough. Because Saul is asking for letters to travel to Damascus. And Damascus, if you look on the map, is not in Jewish territory at all. It's in Syria. We're now expanding beyond the borders of Israel. And he's saying, I want authority to go into Damascus, this other major city, uh, arguably the closest non-Jewish major city. And I want the right and authority to drag those guys back to Jerusalem so that we can deal with them. So one way to think of this is everybody else is in general happy with what happened. The enemies of Christ are happy with getting Christians to just leave, but not Paul. Paul says, I want them back here so we can deal with them. You're not getting away that easily. I want to exterminate it from the face of the planet. So <clears throat> as we um, look at those details in chapter 9, the very beginning, let's think about for a second, what does that mean about Saul and his personality? What do you know about him as a person? just simply looking at the details that you got at the end of chapter 7 and at the beginning of chapter 9. What do you know about him as a human being and his personality? Because everybody's got a personality. Yeah. He had, had, somebody say, he had anger issues? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. He, he definitely is uh, um, committed to that, yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a commitment, a conviction, right? He is not going to let this ride. He's going to, to chase this down and exterminate this problem. What he views as a problem with Judaism. Yeah. Any other thoughts? So as you look at him, if you look at it in terms of good traits, right? Which is what our Lord does. Our Lord looks at what Paul is doing and sees the good traits because he says, he's my chosen instrument. That's what we're going to see in Acts chapter 9. He's going to be said, said, this guy is the guy that I've chosen to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Well, at this point, you can see a lot of reasons not to use him. But there is at least one good reason to use him which is that level of commitment that he's willing to travel where nobody else will go. Because guess what God is going to ask him to do? He's going to have to travel where no one else will go. So as we look at Paul, what we're, we're considering is a guy that has um, a great deal of passion and commitment uh, to whatever cause he's committed to. Uh, a couple of other areas to go over and look. Uh, look over in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, verse uh, 13 and 14. Galatians 1, 13 and 14, Paul will say, You have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. You notice he uses the term beyond measure. I think that's 
referring to the fact where everybody else said, let's, at least, let's get it out of Israel. And Paul says, no, beyond measure, I'm going to get, get it out of the world. We want to exterminate this entirely. And as he says, he's very zealous. And because of that, he is advancing beyond his contemporaries. In the business world, we'd say this guy is being promoted past all of his peers, right? While everybody else is staying in the same job for a year or two before a promotion, this guy's being promoted every two months. He's just being, he's climbing the ladder. He's an up-and-comer. Uh, as we've uh, read uh, previously, um, uh, one of the most important uh, guys in the Jewish world at the time is Gamaliel. And he is this great rabbi, and we find out later that Paul studied at his feet. He's got the right teachers. Uh, Philippians will tell us that he had the right pedigree. He would say uh, that he was a, a Jew of Jews. He has everything to, to be on that track, to be the, the next most important rabbi. He could be the guy that all the other Jews look to with the most amount of influence. Just give him a decade, right? He's, he is, he's the up-and-comer. So what we see here in chapter 9 is going to completely derail that. And that's important for us to see because it's important for us to understand what Paul lost in obeying the gospel. Because if you don't understand what he lost, then you miss a portion of what makes this such an impressive conversion. Because there are people who come to Christ and it costs them very little to do so. They, uh, they have been raised in a Christian family. They have um, already been growing up doing a lot of the ethical things that they ought to be doing. And so conversion is just kind of a natural stepping into the light. right? It's the next natural step in that progression uh, from childhood raised in a Christian environment to now obeying the gospel yourself. That's the, the case for some people. And by the way, I'm a big fan of that case. That's what I'm trying to do for my kids, right? So if you're raising children in a Christian home, you're trying to make it as, as simple as possible for them to go from a Christian environment into a Christian life. But not everybody is that way, and Paul is a great example of that of where the cost of obedience is so very high. He has to give up everything. And in Philippians, he spends quite a lot of time discussing that idea of exactly how much it costs him and how it was all worth it, all absolutely worth it. So in Acts 9, um, we uh, have him traveling to Damascus. And what we're going to do first, before we go in and look at a lot of various details of the actual conversion, is we're going to Talk about what, what I call Saul's initial conversion journey. And uh, because we're typically fairly familiar with his, what's often called his missionary journeys or his apostolic journeys, where he travels uh, sharing the gospel with Barnabas and others. Those ones we're quite familiar with. But this initial journey is one that we're less familiar with. And so, if you look on the side there, there are seven different places that he's going to go in the initial process of him um, being in conversion. He'll start in Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9 is where he starts out because he's looking for letters from the high priest. Where's the high priest? Jerusalem, right? So he starts in Jerusalem. And uh, if you're ever drawing a map of uh, Israel and you want to know where Jerusalem is, you just take the top of the Dead Sea and just like scroll over a thumb's length and draw a little star and you're good. Um, and he'll start in Jerusalem, and he'll head up to Damascus. So he'll leave Israel territory, head into Syria. That, on the road to Damascus, is where the conversion happens. And again, we're going to look at that in detail. But on the, that journey is where he is met by Jesus. He sees a great light. He hears his voice. He's blinded. And then it is in the city of Damascus where he obeys the gospel after having had it preached to him by Ananias. So he goes there to Damascus. And then the next thing, what a lot of people don't realize is from Damascus, he goes to Arabia. Now, let me prove that to you. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12.
In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul will describe a vision. And he'll talk in the third person because it's a matter of boasting. And this is kind of his way of addressing the boasting. Is He's saying, I know a guy. I know a guy who 14 years ago, he went up to the, the third heaven. First heaven is the one where the birds fly. Second heaven is where the stars are. Third heaven, that's where God is. And so he's going to talk about this vision that he had, but he'll talk in the third person. So don't be uh, confused by that. In the context, it's clear it's Paul. So he says in chapter 12, he says, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, uh, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise, and he heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. So one... In 2 Corinthians 12, we find out that Paul, at some point early on, had this vision of heaven. Now, if you track back 14 years, it fits right into the time frame of right after his conversion. But I want to add another set of verses to that. Go over to Galatians 1. And the reason that this is valuable is what we're doing is we're beginning to paint a picture of who Paul is from this point in his life forward. In Galatians 1, verse 17, Paul will say, uh, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. Uh, let's back into verse 16. Um, back into verse 15. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So in Galatians chapter 1, we're told Paul, when he is converted, he goes to Damascus, he's preaching in Damascus, and he does not, he does not immediately go to consult with the other apostles. He doesn't do that. He doesn't consult with flesh and blood. Instead, he goes off to Arabia. Now, where in the book of Acts can you read about Paul in Arabia? Great question. Can't. It's never discussed in the book of Acts. Never shows up. But here's the thing. We know from Galatians that he did. And then in verse 18 it says, Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem. So how long does he spend in Damascus and Arabia and back to Damascus? Three years. And that's why I bring up the 2 Corinthians 12 verse. Because during that three-year time period, where he had not consulted with the apostleship, where he had not been to Jerusalem, where he had been in Damascus and then Arabia, which is desert land, it's not highly populated territory, it's the exact opposite of where Paul will spend the rest of his life, going to every populated section he could possibly find. It is during that time period, when you can track back and say 14 years ago, that was when Paul had that vision. So I want you to imagine in your mind's eye something about Paul that I think is important to understand, to really get him as a person. We know him as a zealous, committed guy. We know him as being fervent for whatever task he thinks is the right one, even if it's the wrong one. He'll go so far as to say he's always had a pure conscience before God. His conscience was wrong when he was killing Christians, but he thought it was right, so his conscience was good with it. Wildly convicted and committed. But now he's got a new job that's going to be given to him when Jesus speaks to him. And he's got to have that same level of conviction and commitment to it as he did to Judaism, which he spent his entire life growing up in. So what does God give him? He gets to see something that the rest of us have to wait. He gets to see paradise. And 2 Corinthians tells us, he can't talk to you about it, right? I saw things in paradise of which I cannot, it's not legal, it's not, uh, uh, they're inexpressible. I cannot share it with any other human being. So if Paul saw it, and he wasn't allowed to share it with anybody else, who benefits from it? Only Paul, right? It's, he's the only guy to benefit from it. So what's the benefit? The guy that we see the rest of our Bible, who... Every day he gets up, and he gets after it, and he is doing whatever it takes to preach the gospel, even if it means being stoned 
and then standing up and going back into the same city, that guy came out of Arabia. That guy came out of having that vision 14 years ago. And so in order to understand him, you have to understand that. So uh, he goes Arabia, then it says he went back to Damascus, uh, and from Damascus he'll eventually go down to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, he'll try and spend some time with Christians uh, and preaching the gospel of the Jews to who he thinks he is the most well-equipped guy on the planet to do that. He says, look, I was a Jew. Certainly, I am the most uh, compelling case, uh, and uh, he's just wrong. Yes. That's my job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. He, he, during this, th this three-year time period is such an unsung hero in the shaping of Paul. Um, to add to that, he's been climbing the corporate ladder, right? He's been an up-and-comer. What happens when he goes to Arabia? He's gone. There's no ladder to climb. You're out in the nothing land. You're in the boonies. And so all of those sorts of things begin to shape Paul into who we know. And I think that's valuable for a lot of different reasons. One, just because the more you know Paul, the better off. I think the better off you will be. One of our major goals this year with our Bible reading is to just get to know Paul better. And the other reason is, is that if Paul had seasons of his life that none of us know about, but shaped him into who he was, you think God ever does that with you? It, it happens all the time where the Lord is shaping us with things, and you say, man, why is my life's not progressing? It just feels like I'm spinning my wheels here. I can easily imagine Paul feeling that way. I know that Jesus is the Christ. Why am I out here in Arabia? I should be in the populous areas. I should be preaching from the rooftops. Stay out here. I got stuff for you. There's a plan that God is working that would make Paul effective in the long run. Sometimes God pauses our journey in order to make us more effective in that journey. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. He, he goes from this compassionless guy, right? I mean, completely mirth mir merciless. Mir I'm sure he didn't have mirth either, but merciless, uh, and, and he's breathing threats and murder, to now he's preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, what a pivot, right? Because you're right, he was very harsh. And you think about the church accepting him. You know, what, one of the things that you read about is that he comes to Jerusalem and nobody wants to have anything to do with him. He, and kind of give the brethren a little bit of a break on that. If, if some of the people there had physically, like, yeah, I was there when his hit squad came and grabbed my uncle. You know, so, I mean, you, you can see that, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You know, one way to think of it is God provides opportunity, right? God provides Saul this opportunity to become who he did end up becoming. But 
we know other people that were provided that opportunity who did not obey the gospel, who they hardened their heart. I mean, so you're, you're absolutely right. God doesn't remove the free will, which is one, why we can kind of look at it two ways. We can be impressed by God, but we can also be impressed by Paul. You're right. Both of those are at play there. Um, he had a choice in it. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? Okay. So <clears throat> eventually, from Jerusalem, he'll leave. Uh, head to Caesarea, where they'll put him on a boat, uh, send him off to Tarsus, which if you um, read, there'll be times where he'll be referred to as Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus is his hometown. And so um, Paul's initial travels are wildly different than what he thinks. Even when he's converted, he has to hang out in Arabia, which I'm sure was not his plan. And then when he comes to Jerusalem, he thinks, I'm the right guy to preach to the Jews. And instead, he's just causing trouble, and God sends him away. And the brethren send him away, too, and say, no, 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 you need to get out of here. You're not effective in Israel, which God has been saying all along, because in chapter 9, if you, if you go back to the text that we're, uh, we're going through, in verse 15, Acts 9, verse 15, look at what Jesus says regarding Paul. He'll tell Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and kings and the sons of Israel, for I show, will show him how much he must suffer for my name's uh, sake. So <clears throat> uh, he is eventually sent away. The Gentiles is where his primary preaching is going to be. Okay. Um, Saul's conversion. Saul's conversion is recounted in three chapters, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. There are varying details in all of them, Here's a good example of one of them. In Acts 9, when he's on the road to Damascus, there comes this bright light, and it says, The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So in Acts 9, they hear a voice, all the, the traveling companions of Saul on their way to Damascus to destroy Christians, drag them off to prison. They all hear a voice, but they don't see anybody. Well, in Acts 22, verse 9, it says, and those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Well, this is an interesting detail. Because in Acts 9, it says they heard the voice, but they didn't see anybody. In Acts 22, it says they heard the voice. Uh, they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Those two verses, by the way, are brought up by critics of the Bible to say it, they're contradictions. But you've got to add the third account. In Acts chapter 26, when he's describing the exact same events, events, down at the very bottom, he says, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language. It is quite likely that what happened was this. There's a voice. They all can hear it's a human voice, but only Paul can understand it. And it may very well be, have been the fact that he was the only one who could understand it because he is the only one who spoke Hebrew. But you have to compile all three of those accounts to get all of the details together. And so, <clears throat> as you look, this is a, a, one of those things worth um, taking some time on. Look at the three accounts, find the things that are different, and you will build with those three a full and complete account of, uh, of Paul. Um, I sent the email out. Uh, uh, so you'd have a chance, so I'll give everybody a chance if they want. Uh, anybody see anything that stood out that was different between Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26? Okay, well, for the sake of time, I'm going to take that as a win and move on. Um, but I would recommend doing that. Um, so, in verse 15 and 16, we're told what Paul's commission will be. But he initially, he's struck by this light, he's spoken to by Jesus, and uh, at first, when he falls to the ground and hears the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, one of the other accounts, by the way, mentions that, uh, that he says, is it hard for you to kick against the goads? Uh, meaning, is it, I, I've been goading you. You think about if you're trying to move an animal, typically if you're trying to move uh, like cattle into a chute, right, Mike? You're going to poke them with something sharp. 
uh, and, and try and get them to go where you want them to go. That's a goad. It's just a sharp stick. What Jesus has been trying to do is get Paul to go a certain direction. <laughs> Back to Craig's point, there have been multiple opportunities for that. He's missed some of them. Paul has not been perfect in this. He's not taken the first goading. Um, if you're looking at Paul's life, what's one of the first goadings that he has to obey the gospel that we know about? There may have been, I'm sure there were others, but what's the least one we know about? Stephen. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He heard Stephen's sermon like everybody else. And instead of softening his heart and obeying the gospel and realizing the guy's right, he says, here, I'll hang on to your coats. I'll be, the, I'll be your valet while you stone him. And Paul had to live with that, by the way. He had to live with the fact that the, the, the details were there if he'd been honest enough. And it, that he, since he didn't obey, all the things he did after that, between then and when he did figure it out, and he did listen, that was, those were choices he had to live with. Uh, and so uh, his uh, question to to Jesus is, who are you, Lord? Which tells you when Jesus speaks to him from heaven, he didn't know who he is. But he does say you're, he's Lord because he understands that part. Right? He understands the fact that he is the Lord. So who are you, Lord? And that's where he gets the detail that changes everything. I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up, enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Can you imagine the things that ran through his mind? The, the scriptures make it clear that the blindness that he faces was miraculous. Right? So from this point, he's blinded by that light, and he's blinded until he gets there to Ananias, and the, the, the blindness goes away, the scales fall off. But the other thing that happens, he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. There is no indication that the not eating or drinking is miraculous. I think it is much more likely that that eat, not eating or drinking has to do with the emotional shock of realizing exactly what just happened to his life. Everything. It would be like me all of a sudden hearing from the Lord above that Mormonism was correct and that I should stop everything I'm doing. And I said, who are you, Lord? And they said, Joseph Smith. I don't even know how I'd process that. It would be such a change, such a complete about face in every way of what my life was about. Or a voice from heaven, who are you, Lord? Muhammad. Can you imagine how that would change your life? It's just, yeah, exactly. And, and, and not just like, hey, I've been, <laughs> I've been living my life, but I've been actively killing and dragging this group off to jail. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a huge, huge thing. The not eating or drinking, I don't think it's miraculous. I, I'm, I think it's, it's, an, it's grief. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he had a front row seat to a man dying by stoning, which is not a pretty way to die, right? And it was a mob, and it's, so it's, it's, it's mean, and it's nasty, and there's gnashing of teeth, and screaming, and, and all of that. And he had just seen that, and he'd approved of it. Yeah, so all of those things. So uh, that's, uh, that's the journey there. So at the same time that's happening in Damascus, uh, a disciple by the name of Ananias is being approached by Jesus in a vision saying, I want you to go and talk to this guy. Ananias does not want to do it for obvious reasons. And so Ananias, as, a, um, uh, as he is being told uh, to go to a street called Straight and to inquire of the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. That's another detail that you now know. He's not eating, he's not drinking, but what's he doing? A lot of praying going on in that guy's life. Oh, absolutely.
Yeah, no, I, I would say, yeah, I would say it is a, it's, it's most likely that, exactly that. Uh, as a fasting, it's, a, it's alongside the prayer. It is a purposeful effort on his part to turn to God and, and through fasting and prayer um, to do what God said. Yeah, and because all he knows at this point, if you're Paul, all you know is go into Damascus, go to that city, and wait. That's all he's been told. So all he's got is a lot of waiting, and during that time, yes, I think fasting is a good word for the, the not eating or drinking. I think it's, it's purposeful. It's, it's, it's by Paul's choice, along with the praying. Um, and so a, as you uh, uh, look at it, Ananias, he's been told in a vision that a man named Ananias will come and lay his hands on him, and he'll regain his sight. But Ananias does not want to go, and the reason for it is, I know who this guy is. Right, But then in verse 15 and 16, we are told that God is going to use him as a chosen instrument. Uh, when you look at Paul's commission in verse 15 and 16, what does, because this is a, a thesis statement for the rest of Paul's life. Right? He's a chosen instrument of mine. These are the things that I'm going to have him do. This is what it's going to cost him. What does it tell you about Paul? What does it tell you about his life? And what does it tell you about Jesus who called him to do this? Right? Because this is Jesus saying, he's my chosen instrument. I'm going to have him do these things, and it's going to be this hard. What, what have you and I learned about both Paul and Jesus through that commission? So one, yeah, Jesus is going to use him. Right? So Jesus. It's interesting, Jesus spoke to Paul on the road to Damascus. Why doesn't he just speak to everybody that way? Right? I mean, that just bright light, boom, 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 boom. Instead, we see a purposeful decision by Jesus not to convert people that way. Even Paul is not fully converted and his journey isn't over until Ananias comes and speaks to him. It's only then that he hears the gospel, he's baptized, all of those things. Which, by the way, he's baptized before he eats and drinks, which tells you something about baptism. So one, God uses people. That's, that's one thing we need to understand, is that it, we are meant to be the people who bring the gospel to others. It, it is our job. You cannot wait for a bright light from the Lord to strike everybody and do our job for us. That's one. Anything else? Yeah. All could take it. Yes, that's right. The same guy who was so committed as to breathe threats and murder and head up Damascus, turns out that guy's made out of some stern stuff, and God can use that, and that guy can take it. So if you are given a job by God, you have the ability and the capability to fulfill that job. Right? And what's it going to cost? Verse 16. What's he say? I'll show him how much he must suffer. That is the cost. To be a chosen instrument of the Lord is almost always going to involve suffering for his name's sake. That is a common thread throughout the Bible, is that if you're going to be a chosen instrument of the Lord, you're going to suffer. It's not going to be easy. Paul got to see paradise in Arabia, but he didn't get to live there. The, the journey that he was on is like every other chosen instrument, right? If the Lord's going to use us, you're going to suffer for his name's sake. Um, okay, so uh, verse 17, And I departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food, and he was strengthened. And so now Saul, from that day forward, begins to preach Jesus. And uh, he's in Damascus and immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. So here, here becomes the key. What does it mean to preach Jesus? He is the Son of God. That's what it means. We've gone from he's a Jewish teacher. This is a, 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 a sect of, of Judaism. 
to Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. The great confession that Peter makes, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what he begins to preach from that day forward. And everybody's amazed by it because, of course, they know who he was. His conversion becomes wildly powerful because of where he came from. And sometimes I think we get it exactly backwards. We look at our lives and we think of all the things that we've done wrong along the way. And how could God possibly use me? Because I did this and this and this, and I'm not, I wasn't like those other Christians that I see who live perfect lives, which, by the way, you're seeing the Instagram version of other human people, uh, beings' lives. But I'm not like them who've made all these good decisions. I made a bunch of bad decisions, so how could God possibly use me? Paul is the answer to that. Yeah. That's right. How could that, what's the pathway for a soul to ever come to Christ? Yeah. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. We do, we do that. We make a judgment. That person could, could, would never o o obey the gospel. And so we stop before we started. And there's a huge danger in that. That Right. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So it, it's, it, it works twofold, right? You have Paul who seemingly has such a pile of baggage. How could he ever be used? And of course he is used, wildly successful, preach the gospel, as well as how could he possibly be converted? So much so that the early church is really convinced that he might just be a spy trying to infiltrate them. Like he's chosen some new pathway to destroy Christians. I'm, we, we, don't, we shouldn't accept him because then he'll know who we all are and then he'll just drag us all off to prison. They were wildly skeptical. Uh, and so uh, there's, a, there's a great deal to be learned from that uh, with Paul. Um, okay, if you get down to verse 25, uh, when many days had elapsed, the Jews had plotted to, to do away with him. And in verse 25, he's lowered down from the wall in a large basket. If you want to make a mark in your Bible between verse 25 and verse 26, that's your three-year gap. Galatians 1, 17 through 18. The three-year gap is between verse 25 and 26. Which is a good reminder to us that your Bible does not tell you all the story. It tells you the story that you and I need to know. Because it left three years out. And it was totally fine with it. Right? And um, be thankful for that, by the way. Because that means everything that's in there is there for a reason. And you, can, you and I can always know that. And can you imagine if every detail was put in the Bible? You think it's a big book now. It would be so much harder, right? So um, there's a three-year gap there. Uh, but then verse 26, he came, when he came to Jerusalem, uh, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Now think about this for a second. How long has he been gone? Three years. They're still scared of him. It's been three years, and they're still scared of him. Nobody has seen him for three years. He's been off in Arabia for three years. And he comes to join the, the disciples, and they are terrified of him still. This is the power of the kind of reputation he had and the kind of reputation he would be capable of gaining for the gospel. Because... The same guy who the disciples go, whoa, 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 we don't want this guy around. Yeah, he's been gone three years. You think some things have happened in his life? No, oh, we still don't want him around. Is the same guy who would go into cities like Philippi and Thessalonica and they would say, no, 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 this guy's here. He's turned the whole world upside down. See, it's, it, it's just whoever he's going to use that ability for. Okay. Um, we are at time there. Um, anybody have any comments or questions or anything like that before we finish up? Uh, class for today. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yep, it, and it happens all the time. And the, the interesting thing is we recognize it with ourselves, right? 
I recognize two years later, I'm not the same guy I used to be. If I met the guy I was 10 years ago on the street, I wouldn't even like him, right? But people who knew me 10 years ago, they don't see that transformation. So we, we've got to, all, all of us have to keep that in mind that people can change. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, he can use all different types of people with all different strengths and weaknesses, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. We'll shut down there.